testing one, two, three. Welcome um, to the third and final term of the African American experience. This section it covers the time period roughly between 1945 to the present day. Uh, it's entitled the Luta Continua, which means the struggle continues, um, which is also a downloadable tune by Big Youth, a reggae tune on iTunes. If you want to check that out, or Miriam Makiba, you want to check that out. Um, your texts are The History of Africa, The Quest for Eternal Harmony by Malefe Asante, and To Make Our World Anew, A History of African Americans. And I will, of course, supplement those with, um, so what I've handed out in class physically is on the Moodle website as the short version, because the long version used to be 45 pages. People used to say, well, why don't you just write the book? Well, yeah, I could, but I would rather y'all read the books rather than write me write a book. The class is the book, <laughs> all right? Especially once you, you, you talk about, we used to actually do movies as part of class before we even televised the class. So now some of those movies, which used to be banned and you couldn't get on the internet, you now can. And that's part of the movie list that's in uh, the syllabus as well. Uh, protocol for the class. Um, you can, I'm old school, so I prefer teaching to a live class. There is also a stream, a live stream that happens only during the broadcast. So if you have an internet connection, you can hook, hook that up uh, and watch it remotely without attending the class physically. You can also um, wait till the YouTube's links are downloaded and uploaded onto the Moodle site and watch remotely afterwards. And those are accessed anytime. There are also rebroadcasts of the class on Comcast uh, 23. I think it's Friday or Saturday. I'll have to check with what uh, the rebroadcast schedule is. But, and it might not be correct in the syllabus, but the syllabus at least has live stream links, I believe. Or I will update it. Because um, this is televised, if anybody's looking for you, you might want to consider not being present. But most of the time, um, it's, it, that stereotypically tends to be women who are trying to escape domestic violence. Um, otherwise, uh, just remember we're in a live recording environment, so if you're going to say something, say it loud enough to be um, heard, and uh, we'll go from there. So, part of um, the uh, what what you'd see online if you downloaded this is basically the. Uh, syllabus cover from a couple of years ago. Um, this class is taught every other term. Um, so part of what I do is uh, up, update it and upgrade it. So part of the logistics, all tests because we are in a televised environment, our take home open book. Uh, it's basically for your knowledge, so it's essentially you, you need to Answer the questions as if you're answering them, not share the wrong answers, which is what typically often happens. So in the, mid, the midterm is week six. It goes out Wednesday, May 8th. It's 50 points with some extra credit built in on occasion. The final is out week 10, due Wednesday, June 5th. It's 100 points. Basically, um, Perfect score on the test alone gets you less than a D. So probably what you want to do and what I insist you do is write. Africans invented writing. Writing is thought. So to perfect that thought, basically all, not only do the tests draw from the reading, lectures, discussion, films, news of the day, your writing should reflect that as well and be seeking to improve and refine that thought. So as KRS-One says, you must learn to read, to write, 
Think about how the past influences the present and the future. I've gotten into some interesting online debates with people about uh, how I'm conflating issues. I'm going, from our point of view, it's not conflating. The issues are related, as I will show you how they're related. I'm not mixing things that aren't related, but they, are, they have related. So, optimally, there will be a five bi-weekly, that is every two weeks, reaction papers due on even weeks. So you have a pass for this week, right? Just react to the material that will be shown to you and, and also within the reading. So bi-weekly reaction papers do even weeks. And uh, one research paper, which is due week, week eight, and it's basically uh, done on any subject in the time period. So from 45 to um, 2013. So, my preference is typed or printed papers, email papers, you can send emails in Microsoft Word as attachments or in the text of the email. I prefer not doing PDFs because formatting changes. So reaction research papers can be on any subject between 45 and 2013 that relates to the African American experience. So, any questions? Now, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. Now, part of what we'll be talking about is stuff that's often hidden, that you don't get in the standard treatment because this is ethnic studies. And our standards of evidence are different. Not that they're less than history. History relies on newspapers. <coughs> history relies on, uh, I'll give you a great example. So. I am not only the oldest, <coughs> in terms of employment, African-American employee of Lane Community College, because there's no actual title for that, senior black employee, uh, <laughs> no. It just means I've survived the longest in this particular environment. Right? So I get asked my opinion on certain things. Now. How many of you are familiar with the term tar baby? No, I heard it before. You heard it before? Have you, has it ever been called to you? No. All right. So black people of a certain age recognize tar baby as a racial slur just like nigger, coon, jungle bunny, etc. Okay? So I'm 58. So I've never heard any context or the use of tar baby except as an ethnic slur when you apply it to human beings. Never heard any other thing until I came to Eugene. Then certain folks would say, oh, it's an emotionally sticky situation. What? No, you just called a black client tar baby in front of a black intern who's a counseling intern who's from the South who said, no, you cannot use that term. That's like calling the client nigger. Oh no, the dictionary says it's an emotionally sticky situation. The dictionary? Who wrote the dictionary? So I got an email from an LCC manager and she said, I was offended, so she's a white woman, I was offended when one of my employees used the term tar baby to refer to a student that kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back to use our services. She didn't identify the race of the student or the race of the employee using the term, but the employee using the term said, oh, well, it's a, it's a sticky or recurring situation and then gave a Wikipedia link. So I go to the Wikipedia link and sure enough, unlike the dictionary, unlike my Macintosh's onboard Microsoft Word dictionary, which defines tar baby as an emotionally sticky situation, but no reference to the ethnic slur, Wikipedia starts off with the West African trickster tale, 
that was popularized by Disney by Joel uh, Chandler Harris's Song of the South. And actually, we could show that movie because you know I have a video of it, Song of the South from the 1940s with black crow, all the black characters like black animals, like crows, which is another one, another ethnic slur. Right? And the whole tar baby thing, Uncle Remus and all that kind of stuff. So yes, it is in fact a West African trickster tale. The rabbit is like coyote. The tar baby is a motif is also part of the Anansi tales. Anansi the spider is also a West African trickster. It's basically about how you act. Even if people diss you, you still have to act correctly. Right? But at the very end, then it says, well, some people think it's a, in a, inappropriate and that it's an ethnic slur, and they quote the New Republic. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with black magazines and black literature, but the New Republic is not a standard of reference for black people. It's kind of lefty, but it is not the definitive word about what is an ethnic slur. So, interesting, like, the ethnic slur doesn't get in there, even in Wikipedia, but it is mentioned, right? So, who's right? How do we determine who's, who's got the correct interpretation? The person who received that. The person who would receive it, yes. Okay? And where did that come from? The mutual thoughts of what they were talking about. Okay, but it's also case law. All right? Okay, that's the ultimate arbiter, case law. Supreme Court basically said if you use, all right, so understand there's a little cultural difference. Among black people, we don't say the N word. We say nigger, straight up. Don't sugarcoat it. Maybe in mixed, racially mixed company, we might say the N-word so you know what we're talking about. But with, within us, we say nigger. All right? So, Supreme Court recognizes nigger as a fighting word, which means the history of the word means if you use it to me and I don't have a relationship with you, if we're not tight, if you are not using it in a context where we're acknowledging shared, present, or past oppression, I can assume you're about to do violence and I can launch a preemptive strike. Boom, fighting words. In the presence of that word, the Supreme Court recognizes it. That's why it's illegal to use that word in a federal workplace, which this is. As an example, all right? So part, that's part of the hidden history where you can see that, okay, if even if the dictionary doesn't have tar baby as an ethnic slur and its use as an ethnic slur dates back to slavery and the dictionary doesn't even have that that's hidden history if even wikipedia buries it at the end then certain realities have been hidden Right? So I'm just showing you, you must not just rely on the internet for your research papers. You need to read books. Right? And so that's why this class is built not only on black authors, but of the African American experience. Now, conceivably it could be taught by a white person, but you would question their ability to teach that. And they would have to answer, you know, Incredibly, what their qualifications are to teach. So, any other questions relating to the material or what you're about to go through? Yes? Can the material be from African um, media sources? Yes, definitely. Cite the source, please. All right? So, ask the next question. So, if the only stupid question is the one you don't ask, ask a follow-up question, too. So, luta continua means um, 
the struggle continues. Now, obviously, uh, when I built and rebuilt the class, uh, if these are not the only people that I want you to think are important, but I might suggest to you that it's dangerous for you not to know who they are. And why, I'll say that. So, for example, this person. Now, there is a hint built into the first page of the syllabus where it does identify who they are. All right, so if you don't know, he, here's another thing. So there's a thing called, in film studies called visual grammar. The old Chinese proverb, picture's worth a thousand words. All right, so what's the brother holding up? Like a thing from molecular structures? Yes, right? Okay. So, molecular structures and uh, what else could you infer from that? He's looking through it. He's looking through it, okay. So, what does that suggest? He's like looking maybe through his perspective. Human perspective, maybe? Perspective, yeah. Okay. Have you heard of the acronym STEM? Mm -hmm. What does it stand for? It's okay. Science, technology, engineering, math. They all relate to each other. Because if you have skill in one, particularly math, you have skills in the other. <coughs> Mad skills. I mean, you can build stuff, you can invent stuff. Without math, you can. Has been done, but is difficult in today's world. Okay, so that's why they actually have programs to help people with science, technology, engineering, and math. Because those folks tend to persist in the higher education environment. Who this guy is, so yes, he's an African American. He's Robert Moses. He is a Harvard-trained mathematician who is also a SNCC organizer. SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. <coughs> he wrote a book called Radical Equations, and he says, algebra is a civil rights issue. What? That's crazy. What does he mean by that? He says, if you don't get algebra in middle school, you don't go to college. Guess who decides who gets algebra in middle school? Hmm. So, as a SNCC organizer, not only is he going to Mississippi from Harvard to register black people to vote, he also wants black people, poor black people, to be math literate. Actually, it is called numerant. Okay, just like literate is not only being able to read and write, but to understand what you're reading and, write, reading and writing and be able to tear it apart and rebuild it and do new stuff with it. Okay, so numerant. So what is one of the problems that we often deal with is people who are innumerate. They don't know how statistics work. Or if they read something that is a statistic, they can because people can use statistics to lie. So you have to be able to understand, well, what is the lie? What are they lying about? That was one of the little debates I had online in this particular forum that's talking about three strikes. So there are three strikes laws. Like, wait, prison is like 
A baseball game? Let's see, three strikes in baseball, four fouls if you're college basketball, five fouls if you're pro. How many strikes should a criminal get? Well, how is it that a guy can get life in prison for a nonviolent offense, and they all have non, and, he, and this particular person, all, all his offenses were nonviolent, and he got sent up for life for shoplifting $28 worth of plumbing supplies from Home Depot. Somebody got it for Snicker Bar. Yes, people have been sent up for life for a Snicker Bar. Life? Wait, the dudes who caused the bank crash not only did not get charged, but are not even in jail. You can get sent up for 10 years in prison for stealing $500 from a bank with a note, but you can steal more com money from with a computer than you can with a gun. How come the people who steal money, millions and billions of dollars don't get put in prison? Because we live in a plutocracy. Pluto? Mini Mount? Oh. Yeah, I know what it was. Plutocracy. I don't know about it. It is a government run by the rich. Plutocrats. They're far, far away, like the planet Pluto. But they un untouchable. Bob Moses, out the uh, algebra project, civil, algebra is <coughs> a civil rights issue. Angela Davis, writing on longtime college professor, still college professor and activist, uh, writing about the prison industrial complex, school to prison pipeline and the prison industrial complex. Man on the left is Bayard Rustin, the man on the right is Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. They are in Los Angeles at the time of the LA riots. That is 1965. Yes? Um, you can. Where are they? Where's the pile? Pass it down. Bob Marley. The musician and activist. For our, our Lane's Rites of Passage program, um, I'm a bit of a science nerd myself, black nerd. So I want to be an astronaut. I want to be an astronaut, just, not just because I want to get into space travel and talk with aliens and land on the moon and all that kind of stuff, but what it takes to be an astronaut. This is doctor, medical doctor, Mae Jemison, black female astronaut. There are something like about 20 black astronauts. So those of you who are thinking of going farther in higher ed and want to get a McNair scholarship, Dr. Ron McNair, who died at Columbia. Was it Columbia or Challenger? Either way, shuttle accident. Scholarship, for, particularly for minorities, but other folks who want to basically go farther in the sciences or math or engineering. So when you look at these black astronauts, they also have multiple degrees. Not just being part of the military, but also having multiple academic degrees. Author Bell Hooks writes, uh, one of the best writers, I think, in uh, critical race theory and feminism. Audre Lorde, famous black lesbian poet and writer.
Constance Baker Motley uh, until her death was one of the highest black female federal judges. She was on the team with Thurgood Marshall for Brown v. Uh, Board of Education, uh, the NAACP legal, term, legal team. General Ben Davis, Tuskegee Airman. El Haj Al Malik Shabazz, also known as Malcolm X, in the mosque in Cairo. John Carlos and Tommy Smith, 68 Olympics. Nelson Mandela. Sent him some special prayers to get over pneumonia. I'm having a brain freeze, but this is the, the upper left-hand corner of the black general who um, was at Katrina, leading the forces at Katrina when, well, when the Klan was shooting back at rescuers. Got to have some balls to shoot back at the army. <coughs> Dalai Lama and candidate Obama. Candidate Obama surrounded by a group of black people play, praying for him. First campaign and Alex Gray's portrait of the president. Upper left hand corner. Who's the actor? Samuel L. Jackson. Halle Berry. <laughs> Lawrence Fishburne and her. Uh, late. Sanaa Lathan, right? Okay. Now, when I ask people to name famous black people, they're really good at sports figures, they're really good at actors and musicians, but naming a black scientist, a black doctor, a black lawyer, that's harder to do. So I wonder, okay, why is that? Because you're not covered in the so press. Much from them about them. Hmm. We don't hear so much about them. Hmm. Wonder why that is. I mean, some of the answers are obvious, but also it could be like what you pay attention to, too, and what you've been conditioned to pay attention to. Upper left hand corner, who's that? Now I've even given a hint. So you look, I may be crazy, I may be old, but you know, if I got these people up there on the syllabus, or even after the syllabus, that they might be significant. And like I said, it might be dangerous for you not to know who these folks are. Hmm? Yes, Howard Thurman. Yeah. Howard Thurman. Last term. Yeah, we did talk about him last term. This is Octavia Butler, black lesbian science fiction writer. So, for example, <laughs> all her characters are strong black women in all her novels. And what she does with, within the genre of science fiction is a trip. So all her characters are strong black women, and they're all in very complex and life-critical cultural decisions that question identity and humanity. Like her last novel, Fledgling, which you know she, tends, she tended to do things in trilogy. So her last novel, Fledgling, is a vampire novel. Except that in her world, the central character is a vampire who appears to be 10 years old, but is actually like 58. And in her world, vampires don't, they are capable of killing humans, but actually they do need humans to live. And so what they'll do is they'll have a family 
of humans around them that they'll feed on every couple of days. And what the vampire, the vampire doesn't drain you. The vampire's venom allows a human being to live for 200 years while the vampire lives for 5,000. Cures cancer. Cures the human of all diseases. So the human lives for 200 years. And this is, her character is the first vampire that has been genetically bred by vampires as a black woman so she can walk in the daylight. And the white vampires are tripped out about that and want to kill her. So, I mean, she's dealing with these themes. Okay, which usually aren't talked about in your typical vampire thing, right? They're not, right? Black, lesbian, woman. So I'm just saying in terms of sexual identity, identity politics, black people do different things. Same with Samuel L. Delaney. Black, gay, science fiction writer. The reason I'm into science fiction is science fiction gives you new ways that you, first, you have to be literate in science. Because science fiction, is, first of all, is about the science. The science is true. But then you make up a story about it. So he has, makes up stories about not only science fiction, but the things that you have to do, the changes that you have to go through to be a literate and culturally literate. He's in particular really good at that. The last is uh, the late... So Samuel Delaney is actually the only one of these people still alive, but the late Swami Turiyasangitananda Alice Coltrane. Uh, jazz music master in her own right and uh, the <coughs> recently deceased wife of uh, John Coltrane. I trust you've heard of John Coltrane. Yes. Okay. Make me feel real old. Huh? <laughs> All right, so well, when this class was uh, teamed with a writing class, this is a partial list of movies. Uh, that I was actually going to change uh, movies that people could look at. So, for example, uh, The Untold Story of Emmett Till, Malcolm X by Spike Lee, Brother Outsider, uh, which is about um, how, um, Bayard Rustin, Spike Lee's Jungle Fever, Antoine Fisher, Spike Lee's Bamboozled, All Power to the People, Bastards of the Party, uh, Randall Kennedy's The N-Word, uh, something New, which is starring Star Sanaa Lathan, uh, White Man's Burden with um, Harry Belafonte and uh, John Travolta, uh, Spike Lee's When the Levees Broke. So, by no means is this a comprehensive list, but these are films which depict the African American experience or refer, uh, in my opinion, authentically to portions of it if we didn't make the film. So it's a partial list. You can review them in a reaction paper for extra credit or as part of your regular reaction paper assignment. So, so what's in a word? So you don't just study what the word means today. So you get a dictionary, if you haven't gotten one. Um, I can suggest criteria by which you evaluate the dictionary that you get. You want a dictionary that gives you the word, the origin of the word and the language that it was spoken in. Because sometimes words change. And don't let the dictionary be the last word. Because obviously the dictionary is constructed to reflect a certain reality. And usually the constructed reality is the dominant culture of the, of the language that is being spoken. So for example, uh, English. The English language um, doesn't have a word for this, so I had to make it up. Now, 
The English were hungry geist. So this is actually a Buddhist term, which literally means hungry ghost or spirit. Okay, so same language, so geist, so poltergeist, noisy ghost, zeitgeist, spirit of the times, hungry geist. Now, our English word hungry comes from the German, and in German it's spelled with an I. Right? So this concept actually doesn't exist in English. So what it is, it's a Buddhist concept. And the idea is that a person who in life was a glutton or an addict dies, and they still have the hunger, but no body to satisfy it. So they still want Right? And you will definitely see this with junkies or meth addicts or whatever. It's like they're possessed by the spirit and the spirit's in the drug and they want more and more and more and more and more and they're not satisfied. Well, Americans are like that too. Look, I was born here. But 5% of the planet uses 50% of the planet's resources to support the lifestyle that allows us to broadcast this signal. Before 1492, there was not trash on this continent. People didn't throw things away. There weren't any poor people. People were considered rich in wisdom because they served others. Not this consumer culture. We <coughs> consume things once and throw it away. Right? Like a hungry geist. Right? So that's why it's not a word in English. Because if we confronted that word, we'd have to question what we're doing. So, don't just study what the word means today. Find out what did it mean in its language of origin, if you can find that. Also, in its culture of origin, how has it changed meaning and usage? So when we talk about the African-American experience, what does that mean today, and what did it mean in 850 BC? I've been reading a, bi a biography of uh, Alexander Dumas' father, the black count. He was a count in France. And mixed race people in France, once they got to France, they were called Americans. Because it was understood, well, White colonists can go to the West Indies and live there, but they're still European. Black people taken from Africa and to French colonies or European colonies in the Americas and grew up there who were born and raised there, they're not French, they're American. That's part of the African-American experience, particularly if you're from Nolens. New Orleans, excuse me. Nah, so, he said. Huh? Nah, he said. First time? Uh huh. No. No. New Orleans. So, are you experienced? Have you ever been experienced? Well, I have. So, when you can't speak their language, it's much easier not to feel their anguish from the group critical mass. So, you can also review and critique um, hip hop. But if you're going to do a hip hop song, you need to print out the lyric sheet and offer it as a critique. Same thing if you're going to do writing or a collage or whatever. So what's in a word? The African-American experience. Africa is a Greek word for, le which means land of the blacks. America after Amerigo Vespucci, the Italian explorer. It's applied to North and South America, now mostly applying to the United States, excluding Mexico and Canada. Notice how that's changed. 
okay? And the politics of why it's changed. So you often have to clarify, oh, well, what's changed in the history? Cutting a canal in Panama didn't separate the continent. Building, the British building the Suez Canal didn't cut off the Arabian Peninsula from Africa. So why are we having this fiction called the Middle East? Hmm. Okay, so while both European words Africa and America are in common use today, it might be useful to understand their older, more appropriate terms. Part of the African American experience is to know the hidden history. Already, not necessarily depend on school to give it to you. This time you're fortunate to get, get that, but most of what I'm teaching is what I was raised with. Okay, to question what they're, it's not just enough, so like De Dead Prez says in their song, They Schools. Yes, they schools are teaching lies, but you need to understand what the lies are and what the underlying truth is simultaneously. So, Al Kebulan. So, understand in Africa, Africa is a continent, not a country. Al Kebulan is the one indigenous word for that continent, which also means land of the blacks. So, this is a more or less contemporary political map of Al Kebulan. But the term dates back before, well, before we were using English, that was be certainly before English even had a written language or an alphabet. So what's in a word? al Kabulan means land of the blacks in one of at least 2,000 languages spoken there, which are still 2,000 languages spoken there. So to be polite and literate in a traditional African ethic, you need to speak at least five languages or three, definitely more than one, and understand the original historical and contextual meaning of the words as they change, preferably without having them explained. You can have them explained once if you don't know. But after that, you're supposed to know. Okay, so that ethic still exists. Overstand, which isn't even a word you can find in the dic dictionary, but overstand means to see from a point of view beyond your immediate circumstance. Seem, now I'm saying, word. So, if you don't know though, it's okay to ask. It is okay to ask. So. The ethnic ethic is you should know if you were raised right. And sometimes we've had to raise ourselves. Okay? If you got good home training, as my grandmother used to say. But if you were raised, quote unquote, white is in quotes, you would not know because white, quote unquote, civilization is not based on knowing or understanding the history, appropriate cultural conduct, and optimal peaceful relations of non-whites, as our conduct in the Middle East wars would indicate. We don't know why the enemy of our enemy is our friend. Or as Dead Prez would say, the enemy, my enemy's enemy is my man. So, White privilege readings, if you haven't heard that, uh, I will post um, one of my favorite versions, but you can basically look at Peg McIntosh's uh, White Male Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack is a standard uh, reference for talking, for beginning to look at what invisible privilege systems are. So, to quote her, I was taught to see racism only in individual acts of meanness not in invisible systems conferring dominance on my group. This is Macintosh writing. So she at, detailed up to um, 
most of the time when you Google this particular piece, white male privilege, unpacking the visible knapsack, there is a list from 1 to 26. I suggest you find the 46 length version. It exists. I can remain oblivious of the language and customs of persons of color who constitute the world's majority without feeling in my culture any per per penalty for such oblivion. So as I would point this out, I have to know about Chaucer and Shakespeare, but you don't have to know about my, my Angelou or Alice Walker or James Baldwin or Malcolm X. I've actually asked in Eugene, you know, when I, yeah, when I'm talking about Malcolm and Martin, they go, Malcolm who? Martin who? And I go, that's like asking who's Angela? If I use somebody in this, well, Angela who? I mean, I actually had this confusion when I write for the weekly sometimes, so I was talking about Trayvon Martin and basically the prosecutor who's, you know, prosecuting Jim Zimmerman is, was named Angela, but Angela Davis wrote a piece about, you know, wh what, how is it this stand your ground law can be applied where a, you know, a quote unquote white person, that's why white is in quotes, can like kill a black kid and assume criminality. Right, so how does that happen? So when I'm quoting Angela and he inserts the name of the prosecutor, I go, no. If I was talking about the prosecutor, I wouldn't use the singular Angela. Well, you have to explain. No, wait, I don't have to explain. You know who I'm talking about when I say Denzel? <laughs> Kobe. Thurgood. Martin. I mean, come on, really? I have to explain that? This must be Eugene. <laughs> so, if I declare there is a racial issue at hand, or there isn't a racial issue at hand, my race will lend me more credibility for either position than a person of color will have. This is a white privilege. Oh, you're playing the race card. Wait, if I'm playing the race card, who minted the deck? And how come when you use race, it's an ace, and when I use it, it's a joker? Huh. Race card. Yeah, okay. I was actually coming, gonna come up with a race card deck just to play with that idea, you know? If I declare there's a racial issue at hand, or there isn't a racial issue at hand, my race will lend me more credibility for either position than a person of color will have, thus, operating to either confirm or deny, usually deny, that raises an issue. I can choose to ignore developments in minority writing and minority activist programs or disparage them or learn from them, but in any case, I can find ways to be more or less protected from negative consequences of any of these choices. Okay, so a Harvard-trained mathematician says that algebra is a civil rights issue. Oh, that's crazy. That nigga's crazy. Uh, what part of it is crazy? The Harvard or the mathematician, or is it the black Harvard mathematician that you have a problem with? He's talking about disenfranchisement. He's talking about disenfranchisement. Who gets to succeed and who doesn't? Where are the hidden barriers? Who invented algebra? Black people. So it should be natural for you to be able to do algebra. And he's saying, the reason that you're not <laughs> is how it's being taught, not the color of who's teaching you. Algebra is basically to de develop the problem-solving skill where the point of view of the worldview of the people that created it is they're observing the natural world. And they're saying, you already have the ability to solve any problem that's in front of you. That's why the problem is in front of you. Because <coughs> you already have the solution to it. You just have to work to get the answer out. 
And what you're going to tend to do is not do the, e you're going to tend to do the easy thing where the way that, that what algebra teaches you is starting at the hardest place first. Okay, that's why we say nigger not the N word. Boom. In your face. Okay, for a higher principle. I have to give it to Kevin Ware. You break your leg on the basketball court and all you're gonna say, instead of screaming in pain, I mean, you got the bone. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Not everybody, okay. NCAA Elite Eight. Oh, no, no, no. You know what I'm talking about now? All right, well, I'll say it anyway for the camera for anybody that wasn't watching it, all right? Brother is basically defending a three-point shot, comes down wrong on his leg, and splits his leg between knee and ankle. Bone is showing out. People can see that on live national television. And they stop the game for like nine minutes, and you know, so it's like people are freaking out. I mean, it's hor that would be horrific to see. I don't think that's ever happened. I don't think, no, it hasn't ever happened. So just from landing wrong. Michael Bush. Got Michael Bush? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, so we're yeah. about basketball. Uh, compound fractures. Damn. Yeah. So, so he's on the sideline and the game has stopped and he's just saying, just win the game, just win the game, just win the game. Ow, too. But just win the game. And they did. I mean, that'd be incentive, I guess. Sure. All right? So, development in ri minority writing and minority activist programs or disparatism, learn from them, but in any case, I can find ways to be more or less protected from negative consequences of any of these choices. What he is basically talking about is sacrificing your individual self for a greater need, even though it's, look, it's winning a game. But, as a, as a general principle in life, something to emulate. 